Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the, uh, the Pasha and Halacha Sheh. Um, please do feel free to unmute yourself and ask uh, questions if you, uh, if you so wish. Uh, otherwise, I'll just, uh, I'll just keep going. Um, I'll also uh, try and check the chat option every so often if uh, someone wants to post on, on the, any questions on the chat. So uh, I wanted to look this week at a, uh, a very central posuk and very well-known posuk in Pasha's Kadoshim. Um, this is the Pasuk of uh, Haftarei HaKnoicha, and uh, I'd like to spend the first half an hour or so of today's shir on that, and then we'll uh, switch to Halacha. Now, um, the central Pasuk is, uh, um, I hope everyone has had a chance to see the handout sheets. If not, don't worry, I'll try and uh, explain as much as possible outside, but on the, uh, both the web link and the email link, I think there's a, a link to the handouts. Um, the central Pasuk in the uh, Sedra, that deals with this mitzvah is in Perik uh, Yotes, Posuk Yotches, Loisikoim Veloisitor, don't take revenge nor bear a grudge, Espinei Amach, against the members of your people, Vahavta Lureach Akmoicha, one should love one's uh, fellow as one loves oneself. Now, there are lots of questions on this difficult Posuk. The sequence of the three parts of the Posuk isn't entirely clear. Loisikoim uh, Veloisitor, part number one. Uh, don't take revenge. Then the second part, the Haftar Reicha Kamoicha. And then the third part, Ani Hashem. What exactly is the connection between these three uh, sections? But what I wanted to focus on for this evening in the short time available is just uh, the core central part that I want to look at today, the Haftar Reicha Kamoicha. The mitzvah to love one's fellow as one loves oneself. And uh, the question here, the very well known question, is uh, well, there are several questions. The first question is can one command emotions? Uh, most mitzvahs, as we are aware, deal with acts. Uh, blow the shofar, shake the lulav, eat matzah from Pesach, uh, don't do malacha on uh, Shabbos, etc., etc. There are mitzvahs which deal with thought, with ideas, and uh, that itself is a topic, uh, the mitzvah of emunah, perhaps, and other such things. And then there's the rare mitzvah that deals with emotion. Lo uh, don't be jealous, is perhaps an example of that. And here we have another mitzvah which deals with emotions. So uh, this is the first question, what exactly uh, is the nature of this mitzvah? Uh, an idea of commanding emotions, love your fellow as you love yourself, um, is that uh, uh, something that can be commanded at all? Uh, more deeply, kamoicha, is it possible psychologically to love someone in the same way as one uh, loves oneself? Vahavtarecha uh, kamoicha, is this a realistic commandment at all? So this is a second uh, question or, or problem with the pasuk. Interestingly, there's a third question over here, based upon the Gemara, a very famous Gemara, in which actually the Gemara limits the idea of a haftarayach kamecha, and halachically, the Gemara tells us that one who is in a desert and uh, only has one flask of water, uh, not sufficient to get both people uh, out of the desert, one's traveling with someone else, one flask of water, which I have, if I share it with my fellow traveler, we will both live for a few more days and then uh, die, we will not have time to leave the desert. If I selfishly keep it for myself, then it will uh, last me enough days to get me out of the desert. The Gemara Paskans Chayecha Kaidwin, that one's own life is first. And the Halacha, therefore, in practical Halacha, the Haftarach Kamecha does not always uh, demand a one, on one to feed, to care for one's fellow as one cares for oneself. So, uh, what are the parameters of the Haftarach uh, Kamecha? And uh, what are the, uh, how, how far does this go? So I want to look at uh, several different approaches to this, uh, to this question. Uh, I'm going to focus uh, for the second part of this uh, Pasha Shea on the view of the Rambam. But first of all, I, I just do want to mention some of the other famous opinions on the topic. Um, there is a Ramban on the Pasuk, Ramban on the Torah, the Ramban in his commentary on the Torah, uh, raises this issue, and he says it's not possible, it's not conceivable, it's not possible that one can love someone as one uh, loves oneself. Um, he says, Haflogger. He says this is a, a, an exaggeration. The, the, the heart of a person is loya kabel, loya kabel leiv adam. A person's uh, heart cannot uh, engage with such an emotion that one loves chavero ka'avas es nafsho in the same degree as one loves oneself. This isn't, it's not feasible, it's not practical. And he addresses this problem, and he suggests a diuk, a nuance of language in the pasuk. 
because this famous phrase, grammatically is a little strange. Because seemingly the the reacha, the friend, the fellow man, is the subject of the is the object. I'm sorry of the verse. Vahavta, you should love reacha. One's friend is the the passive recipient, is the passive uh, uh, subject upon which one's love is 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 uh, showered. So it should say vahavta s reacha kamocha. This would be the normal uh, form one would expect the verb to, the pasuk to take. Vahavta s reacha kamocha. And the Ramban suggests the hafta lo reyach ha indicates a givingness. The hafta one should give love to one's fellow, meaning to say that we're not just commanding in the quality of the emotion, that the love that's offered should be equal. Uh, one should love someone else equally and as much as one loves oneself, because this is inconceivable. This can't be what the Torah is commanding. And therefore, rather the Torah is commanding, the hafta lorecha, one should want and experience the emotion of love, that one's friend should receive everything that one wishes to receive oneself. So the quantity of the love, if one likes, the degree of love, that's not possible to uh, give it to someone else to an equal extent that one experiences and feels it towards oneself. However, what it is possible is to say, all the good things I want for myself, I want them also to occur to my fellow. And this is the nuance of the language, this is the diuk of the language. Vahavta lo reacha kamocha. So says the Ramban. Um, the commandment is not to love someone as oneself, this is impossible, but to love them in a giving manner that they should receive as much as uh, we ourselves uh, receive. Uh, we should want them to have everything that we want for ourselves. This is the view of the Ramban. There's a very fascinating, lengthy piece from the Mesha Chochma in which he's addressing actually a completely separate issue. The Mesha Chochma is addressing the link between the Haftar Rech and Ani Hashem. The relationship between Bein Odom uh, Lechaveroi, which is uh, most expressed by this commandment of love your neighbor, love your friend like yourself, your fellow like yourself, and Ani Hashem, which is our relationship to God. I'm not today going to go into this aspect of the Mesha Chochma. Uh, please God, another year. It really deserves a shir in its own right. Very, very fascinating and important Mesha Chochma. Meshachachma, Rameya Simcha of Dvinsk. He was uh, um, a, a unique uh, figure, really, in recent uh, Jewish history. Died in the, in the beginning of the last uh, century and was perhaps the last figure to combine um, leadership and ability in Pesach Halacha on the highest level with philosophy and with Kabbalah. Uh, most Kabbalah, most Kabbalists don't learn the philosophical works of the uh, Rambam and, and the Geonim. Um, many philosophers don't learn Kabbalah, M- neither of them are often uh, halachists. The Meshach Chochma combines all three in a very beautiful uh, way, and also wrote a very important commentary on the Torah. And he discusses this pasuk, and he says that the Kamocha means the Haftarecha, who is Kamocha, who is like you. And what the pasuk here is commanding or telling us is the quality of empathy. Realize that one's fellow is not so different to oneself. Realize that kamocha, they are just like you. What we feel, what I feel, is what you feel. What I feel is what they feel. Extrapolate from one's own sense of self and own sense of being to realize that even though the other is distant from us, and it's very hard really to put oneself into someone else's shoes, it's very hard to uh, connect and to experience the world and look out from someone else's eyes. Nonetheless, kamocha, we need to empathize and understand and extrapolate from our own sense of self and understand what uh, others are. And therefore, v'ahavta l'reacha kamocha. Love your fellow who is like you. That's the basis of uh, um, genuine care and love and empathy, realizing that this other human being is not so different. So this is a second uh, understanding of this uh, posuk, v'ahavta l'reacha uh, kamocha. There's a third insight or third direction uh, that I want to share in this pasuk, which is based on the commentary of the Mahasha. The Mahasha was Rav Shmuel Edels, um, and he wrote a commentary on the Gemara. And uh, this particular piece of Gemara that he's discussing is a very famous story of Hillel, who uh, was a colleague of Shammai. And the Gemara contrasts Hillel's more in- embracing, embracing approach, inclusive, if you like, approach, uh, to that of Shammai, who took a sterner view of things. It's not that Shammai was, uh, God forbid, an unpleasant person, but Shammai held people up to the highest standards, whereas Hillel was uh, more open to looking at their potential and drawing them in in a gentler manner. 
And the very famous story that the Gemara brings, brings a sequence of stories of different potential geirim uh, want to be converts who approached Hillel and Shammai uh, wishing to convert. And uh, in each case, Shammai felt that their motives were less than uh, impeccable and therefore rejected their candidacy. And Hillel drew them in in a particular way. It's a very interesting Gemara. But one particular story in that Gemara is relevant to our discussion, in which famously a potential ger, a potential convert, approached Hillel and said, teach me the whole Torah al regalachas on one leg, which presumably means what's the single principle on which it all stands. And uh, Shammai rejects this approach. He says this is a, a, an attempt at uh, shortcutting. You know, this isn't the way it works. Torah can't be learnt on a Twitter message. Uh, one has to learn and engage with Torah and understand uh, uh, the complex world of halacha and uh, sincerely involve oneself with it. And the idea that somehow I can teach you one principle that will tell you the whole Torah, this is uh, not realistic. This isn't a way to approach, uh, a serious approach to Torah. And Shammai sent him away. But Hillel dealt with it differently. And Hillel um, did not quote the Pasuk of Ahavta Reich HaKemoicha. What Hillel instead said was in Aramaic. And Hillel said in Aramaic, um, lach, that which you hate, lechavrach lo tavid, don't do to one's uh, fellow, don't do to your friends, don't do to a fellow human being. This is the one principle on which the whole Torah stands. Now, Rabbi Akiva, um, who says a similar thing, uses different language. And Rabbi Akiva quotes the Pasuk, the Pasuk of this is the great principle of the Torah. And Hillel uh, mimics this somewhat similarly. Hillel said it in Aramaic, not in Hebrew. Lach, Letavid, said it in Aramaic. He said it in Aramaic because that was the spoken language at the time. Hillel lived um, in the times of the second base of Mikdash. By that point, uh, the Jewish people were no longer speaking Hebrew, they were speaking Aramaic. It was a spoken language at the time. He addressed this candidate for Gaius, who perhaps didn't speak Hebrew at all, but was speaking to him in Aramaic. And therefore, it makes sense that instead of saying the Pasuk in Hebrew, he instead said it in Aramaic. But the question is, why did he say it in the negative? Why didn't he say it in the positive? The correct Aramaic translation would have been, love your fellow like yourself in Aramaic. And indeed, um, if you look in the Targum, the Targum Unclus translates the Pasuk in the uh, positive in Aramaic, as we would expect. Um, Love your fellow in Aramaic as your fellow. Why does Rabbi Kiva translate it in the, I'm sorry, why does Hillel uh, translate it in the negative? Now, interestingly, we have a second Targum, a second Aramaic on the Torah. The famous Targum that we have on the Torah is the Targum Unclus, but there's a second uh, Aramaic translation on the Torah written by someone called Yonason ben Uziel, who was a translation, who was a Talmud, who was a pupil of Hillel, as the Gemara in Sukkah tells us. And in the Targum Yonasat Menuziel, we find that he translated the Pasuk exactly like his Rebbe, exactly like his uh, teacher. That which you hate, don't do to your fellow. So we see this translation of Hillel was quite a deliberate one. The teaching of Hillel was not the positive translation of the Pasuk, but the negative translation of the Pasuk. And this was how his student, uh, Yonason ben Oziel, the writer of the second Targum, also translates it. And what this is seeming to tell us, and this is how the Masha explains it, is that Hillel was coming uh, to address this point. And Hillel also didn't believe that it was possible to have positive love for one's fellow to the same degree as one can have for oneself. And therefore, Hillel understood that the posuk phrased in the positive really meant to tell us the negative. It's not possible to love one's fellow as oneself, but it's certainly possible to say, don't mistreat one's fellow um, in a way that one wouldn't wish to be mistreated. And perhaps therefore Hill reads the posuk as one continuation. Don't forget, as we started at the beginning of the Shea, the beginning of the posuk says, lo sikom velo sitter, don't take revenge. And therefore Hill read the whole of the posuk as a continuation. Don't take revenge, but care for someone as you would care for yourself, meaning don't mistreat them, don't treat them uh, negatively. And this is the extent of the mitzvah that Hillel thought was uh, possible. However, according to the Mashar's understanding of this Gemara, he didn't believe it was pos possible to positively love someone as oneself. So, so far we've had three approaches to this Pasuk. The question was, 
love one's neighbor seemingly as oneself? Is this possible? And all the three commentaries we've seen um, seem to think that this is not possible. This isn't uh, psychologically realistic. And the first explanation we saw is that of the Ramban, who understands it's more about what one wants for one's fellow as opposed to the degree of love. The second explanation we saw was the Meshach Chochman, who understood Kamocha meant empathy, realizing that one's friends, that one's fellow is like oneself, which is really the root of all decent treatment of others to sort of uh, extrapolate from one's own feelings towards understanding what others are feeling. And the third explanation, perhaps the view of Hillel as explained and expanded by the Mashah, is that this is really a way of saying don't do that, which is negative, as opposed to positive love, because this isn't uh, possible. Before we go on to look at the view of the Rambam, who takes a very different approach, I'll just pause, and if anyone uh, wants to ask any questions on this, I'm, I'm happy to take that. As I said, also, I'm happy to take uh, questions via chat, um, or if someone wants to demute themselves and uh, ask a question, I'm, I'm happy to pause. Okay, so this is the view of the uh, first two, three explanations we've seen. The Rambam, in source three, in source two in the handouts, takes a very different uh, approach to this. Um, in the interest of time, maybe I'm, I'm not going to read through everything the Ramam says. Um, maybe let's jump, in fact, to source uh, three. And in source three, the Rambam is uh, from his Mishnah Torah, from his halachic work. Now, the Rambam uh, wrote his Mishnah Torah to encompass the whole body of uh, Torah that exists, the whole halachic system, and uniquely amongst the poskim, he dealt as seriously with uh, midas, with qualities of personality and emotions, as he did with other more uh, technical mitzvahs, whether it's the laws of Shabbat or the laws of Tefillah and so on and so forth. So the Ramam included in his Mishnah Torah the laws of philosophy, what he believed to be the philosophical beliefs that a Jew's need, Jew needs to adopt, and he also included the character traits that a person needs to develop. And his halachas around character traits, he uh, called Hilchot Deot. Now, uh, we're more used to understanding or translating the word Deot as mind or knowledge, but uh, the Ramam understood the word in a more holistic sense. The word dart doesn't just that mean that which we know in an abstract sense, but it means a, a sort of all-encompassing sense of consciousness. Um, dart is, is how I, I uh, connect and relate to everything that's outside me. And it's for this reason that the Torah famously talks about uh, relationships, even intimate relationships, as yedia, as knowing, Adam knew Eve, Adam knew Chava, meaning to say they connected um, when... Yosef died, it says, or when the Pharaoh, when Pharaoh died, it says, yoda es Yosef. A new king arose who didn't know Yosef. That means to say he knew the history of his people of Egypt, but he hasn't met Yosef, hadn't built a relationship with him, and therefore didn't feel the same loyalty, and therefore was able to persecute the Jewish people. And therefore the word dart means that of quality of character. And the Ramam wrote in his Mishnah Torah a section of halacha, this is source three, called Hilchot Deot, which I translated as the halachas of character traits, or personality traits. And the Raman writes as follows, Mitzvah al kol Adam. it is a uh, mitzvah on each person, Lehoiv es kol echad ve'echad Yisrael ka gufoi, to love every other fellow Jew as themselves. Shanam avahafadu echad kamecha. As the Apostle says, love your fellow like yourself. So the Rambam understands this Apostle too, quite literally, one is obligated to love one's fellow as oneself. Does he learn, like Hillel, according to the Mashar, that this is only a negative? Don't do that to others, which you wouldn't want done to yourself. No, it's not what he says in his Mishnah Torah. Does he learn, like the Meshach Ochman, that this is just about understanding that others also feel like one does, and empathy? It's also not what he says. And he also doesn't say, like the Ramban, that all the mitzvah means is do to others, or want them to have that which one has. He says, no, straight out, one has to love one's fellow as one loves oneself. And the Ramam seem to think that quite literally, it's possible that the emotion of love needs to be equal to someone else as to oneself. Um, it's difficult to know why the Ramam takes a stance. Uh, perhaps uh, the Ramam is a philosopher, we know he was a philosopher, uh, as a philosopher, he's willing to accept such a, a rarefied and abstract objective way of living. 
But the Ramam uh, believed this was possible, and this was what the mitzvah is on people. The mitzvah is for us to love our fellows like we love ourselves. Um, he carries on and he says, Lefichach, therefore, one has to uh, sing the praises of another human being. Look after their money as much as one looks after one's own money. And uh, um, give honor to them as much as one wants to receive honor oneself. And so on and so forth. So the Rambam says that there's a therefore over here. There's a mitzvah of a haftorah The mitzvah is the love. One needs to love someone as one loves oneself. Therefore, one ought to give them honor and praise and care and protection as much as one gives oneself. What's the therefore in the Rambam, the Lefichach? Because I have to love someone else, therefore I should look after them and give them honor and uh, sing their praises, etc. Either he means as a result of the love. Since I love them, therefore the expression that inevitably would come out is that of care and respect and protection. Alternatively, the Rambam means Lefichach, because there's a mitzvah to love everyone as I love myself, therefore, Lefichach, therefore I should act in such a manner, because as we know, the Rambam believes, and he speaks about this elsewhere, that actions cause an inner change. The Rambam believes that by acting externally, that affects and alters our emotions internally, and therefore the way to reach um, an, a genuine sense of internal love and appreciation of others that matches one's... Uh, self-love is by acting in a manner of care and protection and the result of that will inevitably lead eventually over time to a genuine sense of um, love. So this is the first Ramam I wanted to look at. The Ramam takes it on face value that the expectation of Haftalur means such a deep felt love that it matches the love one feels for oneself and perhaps the Ramam is giving us a clue how to get there. If we feel a sense of hopelessness, you know, is this really possible for me to achieve such a um, incredible and astonishing level of care and love for someone else, the answer is beginning acting in that way. And if over time we act in that manner, then uh, ultimately that will uh, impact on our, our inner life and we'll also be able to um, feel the emotions that the Rambam says are demanded of us. Now, the Rambam is consistent with this reading and uh, um, follows this reading right at the end of his great halachic work, the Mishnah Torah. The source we've read now comes from the beginning, where the Raman speaks about emotions and character traits and personality qualities. Right at the end of Mishnah Torah, he deals with um, the halachas of Avelus, of mourning. Um, mourning, Shiva, Leviah, all the associated uh, mitzvahs associated with, uh, with uh, looking after someone who has gone through a process of bereavement and lost someone. And this is printed in Source 4, in the Rambam writes at the end of Mishnah Torah, in the 14th chapter, Halacha Aleph. And again, in the uh, interest of time, I'm just going to uh, try and go through this Halacha fairly fast. And the Rambam says as follows, he says, Mitzvah saseh shel devreim. Here the Rambam is talking about a whole bunch of um, mitzvahs that we're used to, such as Bikur Cholim, visiting sick people, Nichum Avelim, comforting mourners, Lahotzi Hames, actually arranging a Levaya, Lahachnis Hakala, to arrange a wedding for someone who can't afford to do so, Lilvus Archim, to uh, accompany guests, Lesasik, Bechol Tzakibura, all forms of kindness that we do with, uh, for other people. And the Rambam calls all of them Mitzvat Asei Shel Devreim. They are all Mitzvahs are say of their words, which is Ramam code for saying they're rabbinical mitzvahs. These are all mitzvahs drabonon, they're not mitzvahs min haTorah. But then the Ramam carries on at the second paragraph in the Salacha, and he says, Afal pisha kol mitzvahs elo. Even though all these mitzvahs, midivrayim, are only rabbinical, harihain bechlal v'haftoreich kumoicha, they're included in v'haftoreich kumoicha. Kol advorim shata roitze, shiyas osom, anything that you would want that they should be done for you, you should do for one's fellow uh, brother or sister. So what does the Ramah mean over here? He begins by saying that all these mitzvahs, like Bikur Cholim, visiting the ill, Levaya Sameis, accompanying a Levaya, Nicham Avela, comforting someone who is Nicham Avela, comforting someone who has suffered a bereavement, Achnos Kala, arranging someone to get married. All of these are only Drabonims. They're only mitzvahs mid Drabonim. And then the Ramah carries on, but they are included in the mitzvah, min ha-torah, to make up your mind, Rambam. All these mitzvahs drab on, 
rabbinical mitzvot, or they mitzvahs min or they Torah-driven mitzvahs because of the pasuk, v'hafta l'reyach ha And the answer to this question is what we've just explained. According to the Rambam, the mitzvah of hafta l'reyach is an internal state. It's a sense of love and care for others. If one feels that, then inevitably, the consequence of that will be that one will do all these acts of care. If someone falls ill, one will visit them. If someone is bereaved, one will attempt to comfort them. If they're suffering, uh, uh, if they need to get married, one will attempt to facilitate that. So one will engage automatically as a result of the sense of love, all of these. However, Midra Bonon, they said, even if you don't feel this love, even if you don't have the fulfillment of the Torah obligation and feel the love in such a full capacity, nonetheless, do these mitzvot. Why? Because these are mitzvahs of chesed. They're mitzvahs of kindness, and they are the correct and appropriate result of ava, of love. And therefore, even if I don't feel that love, nonetheless, durabonon, I should engage in this act of mitzvah. So according to the Raman, therefore, this operates on a dual level. Min Torah, as far as Torah law is concerned, I need to engage in uh, an, an emotion. It's a sense of feeling. It's a sense of, of internal love. The re- automatic result of that will be acts of care and kindness. Midrabonon, even if one doesn't feel this uh, sense of love, nonetheless, um, one should do these acts of kindness, probably as a means to get to creating the emotional connection that's there behind it. Uh, we're running out of time for the Pasha section, so I just want to make uh, a couple more comments, and then we'll move on to the practical halacha. Rabbein Yona, who we don't have time to look at today, uh, was a uh, Spanish Rishon who lived a couple of generations after the Rambam, and also wrote extensively about character development and Musa, works of Musa and ethics. Uh, there's a very interesting history as to what led Rabbeinu Yonah to particularly focus on this field of Torah. And the history actually connects to the Rambam. Rabbeinu Yonah very strongly opposed the works of the Rambam. Um, the history is complicated, but as we know, the Rambam introduced a lot of philosophy into um, the syllabus, the curricula of Torah learning, and many objected to this, and Rabbeinu Yonah was amongst them. And he went around Spain initially preaching against the Rambam. He felt the Rambam was very dangerous to the development of Jewish thought, and he opposed the Rambam. Later on in life, uh, due to a series of events, Rabbeinu Yonah regretted his opposition to the Rambam and uh, went around uh, uh, apologizing to the Rambam for uh, the criticisms he had voiced against him. He still disagreed with some things, but he felt he had taken the criticism far too far, and he dedicated, as a result, a significant part of his own teaching and learning to the development of, of uh, Musa and ethics. And Rabbeinu Yonah writes extensively about these issues, and on this topic, he disagrees with the Rambam. And he says that the ma'asah chesed, the act of kindness, bikrochonim, visiting all people, inviting in guests, and so on and so forth, are min ha they are Torah obligations. So this abstract discussion we had about the meaning of a ha-tarayach ha is it about emotions, as per the Rambam, which will then hopefully be expressed in action, or is it about the action turns out to be an argument in practical halacha? What is the mitzvah? Is the mitzvah the emotion, or is it the... Um, practical uh, action. Now, according to the Rambam, we understand very well why we don't say uh, bracha on doing mitzvahs of chesed. This is a very interesting puzzle, and uh, one that needs greater exploration than we have time for today. But we know that before we do a mitzvah, we make a bracha. If I'm going to do if I'm going to shake a lulav, I make a bracha. If I'm going to eat matzah, lachilas matzah. But when it comes to mitzvahs of chesed, we don't really say brachas. We don't say a bracha before we do achnasas archim, we don't really say bracha before we give tzedakah, and so on and so forth. What, why is this? Now, according to the Rambam, we have a very good answer to the question. Because the, bra- the mitzvah, in truth, is really the love. The action is merely the external manifestation of the mitzvah, rather than being the essence, at least, of the mitzvah min ha um, Rabbi Niono might also be able to answer this question. He, he would argue that nonetheless, the motive for doing this should be an act of care. Why do we say brachas before we do mitzvahs? So one of the reasons given, the reason that the ritva gives, is it's a way of, of reminding myself why I'm doing the mitzvah. A bit like many people before they do a mitzvah say, hinani I'm prepared and ready to do the mitzvah. So in a sense, the bracha on the mitzvah is a type of hinani mukhanu mazuman. It's a mental preparation before one does the mitzvah to remind oneself, I'm doing the mitzvah because Hashem has commanded me to so do. It could be when it comes to chesed, this isn't the motive that's meant to be going through one's mind. When one asks oneself, why am I doing the act of chesed? The answer is because I care about other people. 
Why do I care about other people? Because that's the right thing. I should care about other people. And indeed, the Torah commands us to care about other people. But when I'm doing the action, what drives it is meant to be the motive of care, as opposed to the halachic imperative of the mitzvah. I shouldn't just be doing acts of kindness because Hashem tells me to. I should be doing it because I care about it, and Hashem has told me to be a sort of compassionate person who cares about uh, other people's uh, feelings and uh, emotions. This is one nafgamina, one implication or consequence of the machlokas, the argument between the Rambam and Rabbi Niona, perhaps. Um, a second understanding, which actually translates into a practical difference, is the concept of oisek, the mitzvah, potel min ha-mitzvah. There's a halachic concept that if I'm busy with one mitzvah, then I'm, I, I am exempt from doing other mitzvahs at the same time. Now, the Shulchan Aruch discusses the scenario of someone who's attending a levaya, very sadly, and they realize that they don't have time, or rather they realize they haven't yet said Shema. So the Shulchan Aruch says, if the levaya has started, um, don't stop to say Shema, be wrong. I'm now honoring the dead person. I'm giving comfort to the family. How can you stop and step out of the Levaya and say Shema? This would be wrong. Wait till the Levaya is over and then say Shema. What will happen if it's so near the deadline for Shema? That if I continue in the Levaya, I'll miss being able to say Shema. Shulchan says, what can you do? Oh, you sake the mitzvah, part of the mitzvah. Someone who's involved already in one mitzvah can't stop the mitzvah to do another mitzvah. And therefore, we'll miss Shema. The Ramah, however, argues on this. And the Ramah says, if one has time to say Shema later, then one shouldn't stop it, step out of the Levaya to say Shema. However, if it's near the end of the time, and if one doesn't step out of the ta- Levaya to interrupt for saying Shema, then one will lose the mitzvah completely. Then one should step out of the Levaya and say Shema, and then ca- carry on accompanying it. Now, what's this machlokas? What's this argument about whether one should or shouldn't step out of the funeral if there's no time left? And it would appear that, uh, and the Bira Halacha, on the Mishnah Bura, that seems to explain this in this way, I'm slightly paraphrasing what he says, that this is the Machlokas. If we hold like Rabbeinu Yonah, that the mitzvah of Levaya is a Torah obligation, then we'd say like the Shulchan Aruch, don't interrupt the Levaya in order to say Shema, even if one will lose the Torah obligation of saying Shema. However, if we follow the Rambam, who holds that really the mitzvah is the love, the action is just the external expression of it, which is only a rabbinic obligation, then we'd say like the Ramah, that one should, if there's no time left, one should interrupt the Leviah for a few moments, say Shema, and then rejoin it, because we wouldn't say that engagement with Eidra Abon on Mitzvah is enough to exempt one from Shema, um, since the true Mitzvah is the love and care and compassion, rather than just the external expression and manifestation of it. So this is a little bit of insight into the Mitzvah of Haftar Reach the view of um, three great figures, the Masha in his understanding of Hillel, the Ramban, the Meshach Chochma, who don't believe that the Torah is commanding a level of love equivalent to one's level of love for oneself. Um, Rabbi Yonah, who talks about the mitzvah really being the action, B'kocholim, Achnas Haskala, Sadaka is the external action, and the view of the Ramam, who believes the heart of the mitzvah is the heart, is the emotion, is the feeling, and uh, the external expression of it, the action is a, something that should flow naturally, and if it doesn't, there's a drabonon, but that's not the essence of what the uh, mitzvah is. So that uh, draws us to a conclusion for the first half of the uh, shir. I'm just going to pause it for questions and then we'll move on to the second half of the shir, which is practical halacha. Okay, so we'll move on to the uh, practical uh, um, halacha that I'd like to uh, address and speak about a little bit today. Um, I think the, the we, we were in the middle of dealing with um, Hilchot Kashrut, but um, given that there's been quite a long interruption to Pesach and the uh, unfortunate uh, international events, I thought maybe I'd shift sideways a little bit and speak about one particular area of halacha in uh, Kashrut, and this is the mitzvah of Hafroshas Chala, that when one bakes uh, bread or cakes for that matter, a dough, one has to take challah um, from the baking, a small quantity of dough, which, as we know, we burn. And uh, this is an important uh, Torah obligation. This is an important uh, mitzvah to do. And if one doesn't do so, uh, when there is such a requirement, then it's effectively uh, a form of non-kosher food. The challah is uh, forbidden. One isn't allowed to eat the challah. And uh, um, it's effectively non-kosher. It can uh, make one's utensils non-kosher. It's very serious set of halachas. 
And uh, I wanted to spend some time over this week and uh, perhaps a couple more weeks just running through this very important uh, practical area of halacha. Now, um, just to help us understand it, I'm going to share a screen of um, the major psukim that deal with this issue. Uh, can, can, has, is everyone able to see the, uh, see the screen now, which has the uh, psukim? Yeah. If someone can just nod, uh, you can see the screen. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So the primary pasukim that deal uh, with this topic are uh, um, a set of uh, pasukim in, in uh, Sefer Bamidbar, the 15th chapter of Bamidbar. And it says as follows, mm-hmm. Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, mm-hmm. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, mm-hmm. When you come to the land, where I am going to bring you, when you eat from the bread of the land, tarimu truma la Hashem. You should uh, set aside a portion as a gift to Hashem. Reishis arisaseichem, the first of your dough. Chala should be chala. Tarimu truma should be a truma that's tithed. Um, trumas goren, just like the truma of the threshing floor. Um, so too came to remote them. So you should tithe this tithing. So this pasuk is a, a very interesting pasuk as the source for the mitzvah of um, challah. The first thing to point out in the pasuk is that it refers to the challah as truma. Now we know the phrase truma from all sorts of other places. Um, when you uh, get fruit and vegetable in Eretz Israel, one needs to, con- con- uh, needs to check that truma has been taken from it, uh, mass has been taken from it. This is the tithes that are given to the Kurnim and the Levium. And the Torah uses identical language here as it does in uh, um, other cases. Um, this is a truma that needs to be taken. It's a type of tithing and a very important halacha. The second thing one sees in the Pasuk, and I'll draw your attention to it in Pasuk Yud Ches, Pasuk 18 and Pasuk 19, when you come to the land of Israel, meaning to say that at least as far as the Torah is concerned, this is a mitzvah hatzluy of Oretz. This is one of the commandments that applies in Eretz Yisrael rather than in Chutzlaret. So just like here in Chutzlaret, you can go to the supermarket and buy an apple and have no concerns with kosheras. Whereas if you buy an apple in Eretz Yisrael, you need to check that it has a certification, it has a heksha, that trum and masa have been taken. And if you walk into a supermarket here, you just buy the apple, you walk into a supermarket there, you need to check on the door as you walk in next to where the uh, health certificates are and uh, everything else that is important in the supermarket to check that there's a heksha there that the uh, mass and trumas have been taken from this fruit. Similarly, bread created and made in Eretz Yisrael has the mitzvah of hafrash al Bread, dough created in Chutzaret, as far as the Torah is concerned, does not have a mitzvah of hafrash al does not have the mitzvah of chala. This is the second point to make in the Pasuk. The third point to make in the Pasuk is a very fascinating one. What actually is the translation of this word chala? So we use the word chala in uh, colloquial life, to refer to the, uh, the loaves of bread that we have on, uh, on Shabbos in particular, that we make Alecha Mishnah from. But in classical Hebrew, in biblical Hebrew, what is the meaning of the word uh, chala? Because the Pasuk says, um, in Pasuk 20, in Pasuk Kaf Gimel, Reisha Sarisa Seichem, the first of your dough, chala, Tari Mitruma, you should take a gift, take a tithing. So what is this chala? Is the word chala, the name of the tithe itself? Or is the word chala the name of the piece of bread? Now Rashi understands the term chala to be referring to a loaf. Chala, he says, means the loaf of bread itself. So what the Pasuk is saying is, the first of your dough, the first of your kneading trough, chala, which is a loaf of bread, trimmer, you should separate. In which case, the mitzvah isn't really the mitzvah of chala. The mitzvah isn't hafrashas chala, hafrashat chala, separating off the chala. The mitzvah is taking truma from a loaf of bread, which in Hebrew is referred to as a chala. Now, fascinatingly, the nusach bracha that we say when we take chala is the hafrish chala, to separate chala, or perhaps the hafrish chala min ha'isa, to separate chala from the dough. But this is quite inaccurate in terms of biblical Hebrew. Because in terms of biblical Hebrew, you're not taking the challah from the dough, you're taking the tithing, the truma, from the challah, from the loaf. And Rashi, um, 
believes that this was the wrong text of the uh, bracha. Rashi was of the opinion that the correct bracha was the Hafish Truma, that one should take uh, Truma. That was what Rashi believed was the correct bracha to make on uh, Chalo. Our bracha is somewhat of a mystery because it's inaccurate in the language of the Pasuk. And the Pasuk isn't uh, La Hafish Chalo uh, Minha um, Esau, the Pasuk is to take Truma from the Esau, from the Chalo. So this is a, uh, a difficulty in the, uh, in the Pasuk. It would appear from this, therefore, that the Nusach, the text that is coined by the sages for, for brachas, was not always um, accurate in terms of the halachic or uh, um, um, uh, biblical Torah language used for the mitzvah, but fitted the manner of colloquial speech of how people developed their use of Hebrew. Um, so says the Nutsiv, the Naftali Tzvi of Berlin, the Rosh Hashiva of Velozhen, and a grammarian of note. He points out that many brachas fit this theme and do not accord with the way the Torah um, uses uh, biblical language. And I'll give you one very, uh, a couple of clear examples of this. Um, one of them is the mitzvah we say when we put on tefillin. The word tefillin doesn't appear in the Torah itself. The Torah refers to them as totafos. Nonetheless, we use the later language development rather than the biblical language, and we refer to them lonia uh, tefillin, al mitzvah tefillin, we refer to the mitzvah tefillin. So in this case, okay, we're not using classical Hebrew, we're using Mishnaic Hebrew for the language of the bracha. At least we're not saying something inaccurate. However, when we put a mezuzah up on the door, this makes no sense whatsoever in terms of correct language. The Pasuk says you should put the mezuzah, you should put this text, al mezuzah on the doorposts. Mezuzah means a doorpost. You can't put a doorpost on a doorpost. So when we say you're putting a mezuzah on the doorpost, as far as biblical Hebrew is concerned, this is completely inaccurate. Nonetheless, in colloquial Hebrew, as Hebrew developed, this is what we refer to. When we say mezuzah, we don't mean the doorpost, we mean the mitzvah associated with the doorpost. Fascinatingly, Chazal coined the text of the bracha in line with the colloquial use as opposed to the more accurate technical use. And they said, We put the mezuzah up, and the bracha we say is, on fixing up a mezuzah. So the language of brachas doesn't always accord with uh, the correct use it accords with how Hebrew has developed and how colloquially we refer to the mitzvah. And therefore, similarly, the Nutzid says, when we talk about l'hafrish chalom min ha'isa, in classical Hebrew, that makes no sense. What I'm saying is I'm separating the loaf from the dough. That doesn't make sense. But since we've developed the language where we call, refer to chalom as the mitzvah that's taken, therefore the bracha that's said on chalom is l'hafrish chalom min ha'isa. Why do we have this mitzvah? Well, from the language of the Pasuk, it's clear that it ties in with um, many agricultural mitzvahs. Um, it even refers to the portion of dough that one takes as racist as the first, reminding us perhaps of the Kurim, the first fruit that used to get given, uh, taken to the base of mikdash, given to the coin. And therefore this would appear to be in line with those mitzvahs. It's an expression of appreciation to Hashem for the gifts of what we have. When fruits grow on the tree, we take the first fruits to Yerushalayim. When we harvest our wheat and our barley and our grapes and our oils, we take truma and masa and give it to the cone. And similarly, every time we bake a loaf of bread, we take off some uh, portion of dough. And in the times of the Beis HaMikdosh, when we had tahara, when we were ritually pure, that would then be given to the uh, cone. So this is the background to the mitzvah. The name of the mitzvah really is truma. We refer to it colloquially as uh, chala, and the language of the bracha reflects this. And uh, the reason behind the mitzvah is presumably one of gratitude for the gifts that we've been given, like many of these mitzvahs, satuliyos baret, um, linking us also and connecting us to uh, Eretz Yisrael in particular, which is what, how the laws of truma and maser work. Now, I've already pointed out that um, the mitzvah of chala primarily, as far as the Torah is concerned, was given to dough made in Eretz Yisrael, as opposed to dough made in Chutz Laret. And in classic halacha, there's a number of differences between dough made in Eretz Yisrael and dough made in Chutz Laret, because in Eretz Yisrael it's the mitzvah min ha-Torah, it's a Torah mitzvah, whereas in Chutz Laret it's merely a rabbinical mitzvah, as per the language of the Pasuk that we saw, and the language of the Pasuk tells us that this is b'choya b'ochon chom lechem it's a mitzvah that applies when you are eating with the bread of the lands, as opposed to in the diaspora, as opposed to in Golos, in Chutzvaret. As a result of this difference, that Chala in Eretz Yisrael is Min HaTorah, and in Chutzvaret it's only uh, Rabbinic, 
there's a number of leniencies that apply in Chutzaret. Um, the first leniency that applies is the quantity of challah that we need to take. In Eretz Yisrael, in Chutzaret, there's no measure. One just takes a, uh, a small piece of dough. In, Chutz, in Eretz Yisrael, um, the measure was one in 24. One twenty-fourth of the dough used to be given to the uh, Kohen. A second distinction is that in Eretz Yisrael, if one hasn't yet taken the challah, one cannot eat of the dough. Whereas in Chutzaret, if for some reason one is unable to take the challah straight away, one can eat of the loaf of bread, as long as one leaves some over and then takes the challah then. Now this is dangerous practice, this isn't wise to do, because if one starts eating the loaf, one may finish eating the loaf and end up eating forbidden food. But interestingly, in principle at least, it's possible to start eating the loaf and then take the challah afterwards, if one is stuck, if there's no alternative. And I'll discuss what I mean by no alternative in a few moments. But if one's stuck and cannot take the challah now, one can start eating, as long as one leaves some of the loaf over and is then, um, then takes the, uh, the challah. In Eretz Yisrael, that isn't the case. One isn't allowed to eat the food until one's taken the challah. And as I said, it's effectively treated as uh, non-kosher food. Now, in practice, in Eretz Yisrael, even in Israel, people do not take one twenty-fourth of the dough. They only take a small amount of uh, dough for the mitzvah of hafash challah. And the reason is because, sadly, nowadays we're not able to give the challah to the Kohen. Um, our Kohenim are presumed to be Tommy. We're presumed to be Tommy. When we make the challah, the challah becomes Tommy through the making process, through the baking process, the kneading process itself. And therefore, even in Israel, uh, challah can't be given to Kohen. And therefore, even in Israel, a minimal amount is given uh, is, is separated off, tied off, when the challah is taken. However, an important uh, halachic principle that does remain different between Eretz Yisrael and Chutz Laretz is what happens if one forgot to take challah. So here we come to an important set of halachas which are very practical. Challah should be taken when the dough is made. That's what the Pasuk says. Reishis arisei seichem. The kneading trough, the dough, the isa. When it's in dough form, that's when challah should be made. So one kneads the dough, one then separates uh, a piece of challah, and that's the mitzvah of a fashat challah. What happens if one forgot to do so? So one can take it from the loaf, from once it's already baked. What happens if Shabbos comes, and one realizes as one's eating, uh, one's about to start one's Shabbos meal, oi, I forgot to take challah from this uh, challah. Now we will see later that not in every case is there an obligation to take color. It depends on the quantity made and, and so on and so forth. Please God, uh, next week we'll get up to that and we'll be able to discuss the halachas of when one does and when one doesn't take color. But if in principle one made a large batch of dough such that one needs to take color from it. And one realizes Shabbos has come and one's forgotten to take color. So on Shabbos one cannot take color. Why not? Because on Shabbos there's a halacha not to fix broken things. This is called makkeh bapatish. Not to repair something that's broken or not to complete the making of something. So for example, on Shabbos, there's many malachas I can't do. I can't build a building. I can't cook. I can't uh, burn something. But there are occasions when no other malacha is being done of the 39 malachas, bar one. And the one that may include things which aren't included in others are when I'm completing and finishing something off. So for example, if I have a flat pack leather balloon ordered online, which arrives in the post, and I want to blow it up on Shabbos to play football with it. So blowing up, which malacha is it? I'm not carrying it, I'm not burning it, I'm not baking it, I'm not cooking it, I'm not sewing it, I'm not weaving it, I'm not dyeing it and changing its color. What malacha am I doing? And the answer is of the 38 other malachas, nothing. But there's a 39th finishing something off. This is called makkeh bapatish, the last hammer blow, finishing something off. If I have a beach ball, there's no problem blowing that up on Shabbos. Why not? Because a beach ball is designed to be blown up and, and uh, uh, um, inflated and, and deflated, inflated and deflated. This is how I use it. I'm not finishing it off. But a leather football is designed to be blown up and, and that's it. And maybe occasionally topped up. But this is the completion of the malacha. And therefore, in the same way as I can't assemble my IKEA furniture on Shabbos, I also can't blow the football up. It's makkeh bapatish. Now, Chazal understood, at least rabbinically, that taking challah from a bread is like makkeh bapatish. It's finishing off the bread. It's inedible. It's not edible. It's inedible until I take challah. And therefore, if I take challah on Shabbos, this is a problem. This is makkeh bapatish. So I can't do a fashat challah on Shabbos. So now I'm stuck. What do I do? It's Shabbos, and I can't eat the challah. So if it's in chutz diet, I have a solution. I can start eating the challah, leave a small part of the challah over till Motsi Shabbat, and then I can take the challah. Because as we already explained, in Chutzlaret it's only Drabonon, 
And therefore they said you can even take color after it's been eaten. But in Israel, problem, stuck. One can't have fashion color on Shabbos. And therefore, this would be a problem. So this is halacha number one. Kutzorit, we can take our khala even on uh, Shabbos itself. Ideally, take khala when it's dough. If one forgets, take it when it's a loaf. If one forgets to do that also, then take it when it is a, uh, even on Shabbos. Uh, sorry, to eat it even on Shabbos, and then after Shabbos, leave a little bit left over, and then one can take khala on that. Um, I will mention here as an aside that if after one bakes one's chalas for Shabbos or, or any other uh, case like that, one realizes that one hasn't taken chala, one then at that point needs to take the chala. Now to take chala, one will have to break a small piece off the chala. And one doesn't want to do so because one wants to have whole chalas for Shabbos. Nonetheless, the halacha is that one should do so because one can't eat the food without taking chala, and that has priority over the issue of Lecha Mishnah, and therefore one can break off a small piece of uh, the chala in order to do the mitzvah of tithing, of taking chala, even though that means that the bread's loaf will not be whole. There are post who have the view, of Shlomo Zalman, Arbach, and others, that this does not take away from the completion of the loaf. On Shabbos, we're meant to use a complete whole loaf, However, since the loaf is inedible, is not edible until the challah is taken, they argue that removing a small piece of challah is, is the completion of the challah. That's how I complete the manufacturing process, as we've just discussed. And therefore, they believe that a small piece taken off the challah in order to do the mitzvah of taking challah would not be a problem and it would still count as lecha mishnah. And therefore, in practical halacha, if one realizes after one's baked the loaf that one forgot to take challah and it's not yet Shabbos, Take the challah, then break a small piece off, and it will still count as a whole uh, challah. It isn't a problem halachically. How big should this piece be? Only a, a small piece, a, uh, um, a little nugget. Um, in Eretz Yisrael, when people were ritually pure, when they were tahor, as I said, 124 should be taken. But in Chutz Laretz, uh, we can take any amount. And nowadays, even in Eretz Yisrael, um, only a small amount is taken because uh, we are not tahor. Um, I'll pause there for a minute before I go further, just in case there are any uh, questions. If anyone wants to ask anything, please uh, unmute yourselves. Otherwise, I will... Uh, Shalom, Rabbi. Doron, yes. Shalom, I just wondered, if you said you can take any any amount from the, the loaf, so are we talking about crumbs? Can you take, can you leave the, the whole halal all and just take a few crumbs from the bottom and then you've got no problem? Okay, in principle, yes. In practice, our minag is to take a, uh, um, you know, what looks like an olive, a regular olive sized piece, a small piece. But as far as strict halach is concerned, even, even a small amount would be sufficient. That's correct. Uh, here in Chutzaret, here in or nowadays when we're, when we're Tommy. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll go on. Okay. Um, on what size dough should one take uh, challah? So uh, the, the measure of the dough that has an obligation of challah is a little bit complicated. Um, the Gemara, it comes out from the calculation of the Gemara that um, for technical reasons, 43 and one fifth of an egg is the quantity of dough that one uh, needs to have to be obligated to, to take challah. So there's various um, halachic measures that are used in the Torah, of which we're aware, including a kazayis, an olive, a kabetza, which is an egg-sized quantity. And uh, as far as the halacha is concerned, 43 and a fifth beitzim, 43 and a fifth eggs, is the quantity of dough on which there's an obligation to take khala. Now, the matter of shiurim, of measures, is a complicated one. Um, it's unclear exactly which size eggs and olives Chazal were using. Um, to this day, there's, dis there's different sizes of eggs and uh, not all fruits come in the same size. And the uh, exact way of measuring the biblical quantities has uh, become a little bit lost. Um, this, is a, uh, this time of year, uh, Pesach, is a time when this is always discussed in terms of how much matzah one should eat and so on and so forth. Um, the calculations are, are complicated. I'm not going to go into them in too much detail. Uh, however, the standard measure used is that of Reb Chaim Noer. And uh, based upon his calculations, one should take challah if one is using flour of 1.2 kilograms, but without a bracha, because it remains a matter of doubt. And if one takes 1.6, if one uses 1.6 kilograms of flour, 
then one should take Chala with a bracha. That's uh, how I paskin. There are different measures out there, and uh, different uh, Rabbonim take different approaches, but I believe this to be a, a normative and sensible one, that at 1.2 kilograms one should take Chala. Anything less than that, there's no obligation to take Chala, and at 1.6 kilograms uh, one would even take Chala with a bracha. That's the appropriate measure to take it. Um, I'll stop there because I've run out of time. And uh, please, God, next week uh, we'll use the same format, half an hour on the Pasha, and then half an hour to continue the halachas of Chala. Um, I would like to discuss uh, many more halachas in this connection, um, including when one takes Chala from uh, um, other doughs, like cake doughs, and how that works, and uh, various other practical details of this very important set of halachas. Um, looking forward to seeing everyone, uh, please, God, uh, next week. And thank you so much for joining. Ah, uh, good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.